look at the Trinity, what we said very fast at the end there. I wasn't uh, really satisfied. Uh, there is only one God who exists in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each co-equal and co-eternal with the others. That was our working definition. <clears throat> and then I'll just jump to this slide. And remember, we went through each of these. <clears throat> That's basically six false ways of looking at the Trinity. And we went quickly through all of them, and I know that might be a bit overwhelming, <clears throat> but I think you're smart. You can figure it out. There's not three gods. We're not saying that. And I want you to keep in mind again why I was negative on the analogies. Because the analogies always tell us one of these false things. Oh, God is like an apple, and there's three parts. No, that's not what we're saying. That's partialism. That's one, you know, partialism, Patrick. That's <laughs> one God existing in three parts, okay? We're not saying, and if you put Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit and you stick them together, then you get a whole God, okay? That's not it. And we said the same thing over here. It's not as if I'm a father and a son and a husband and that, re that represents God. No, that's a false representation of God, that's modalism, okay? Oh, uh, what, I, what I want you to get your mind around again is every one of the analogies has some, I think, fatal flaw to it that basically makes it a bad analogy for what we actually believe about the Trinity. That's why I don't want to use them because they are misleading, all right? Don't misunderstand me. Some analogies are a little better than others. Some are outright horrifying. But the fact still remains, none of them really clearly portrays God in Trinity as to what we believe. One God existing in three co-eternal, uh, co-equal persons, and yet still only one God. Here's something that we didn't look at last week. I skipped past this slide because of time. And that is, and it's going to be helpful for us when we talk about the two natures of Jesus today. In church history, which we'll look at sometime in the future, um, you basically have the western half of Christianity and the eastern half. And they eventually start to drift apart and they split about a thousand years after Jesus. And one will become in the West, Western Roman Catholicism, and in the East will be Eastern Orthodoxy. And they kept talking past each other on the whole Trinitarian debate. Because in the West, they tended to emphasize the unity of the three persons at the expense of the three persons. And so they tended to have errors like modalism, just one God, one person, or partialism because they were emphasizing so much that all three of the persons are completely equally God. And in the eastern half of the church, they tended to emphasize the distinctions of the persons. Okay, so I said last week, of the three persons of the Trinity, which one became a man? Duh, the Son. The Father did not, the Spirit did not. They had different roles in, in, in this regard. And that emphasis might begin to sound like tritheism if you want to maintain the oneness of God. Okay, and I, uh, this is going to be helpful when we get to Jesus and how we are now going to balance Jesus having two natures, one being human nature, of course, and the other being a divine nature. These are just the problems, and it took the church to get past the language of each half. Uh, you, you know, every time you describe the Trinity, it sounds like you're talking about three gods. Oh, you know, every time you describe the Trinity, it sounds like you're talking about God is, you know, made up of parts. They're talking back and forth past each other, all right? It's just to help us. And then came this very busy slide at the end that I think we looked at for about 30 seconds last week. So, in essence, this is just to try to help you. <clears throat> Remember, the triangle is not a great analogy because it kind of, you know, makes it sound like each is part of, you know, the triangle, one-third of it and all that. But this is just to show you the relations 
between them. So there's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The Son is eternally begotten. We're told in John that he's begotten by the Father. Now, when you and I hear the word begotten, we start to think of birth, of course. And when we hear birth, we, we think of beginning. And that is not what we're saying here in that sense. We're not saying that the Son is created by the Father. This is created by somebody who makes chairs. It's not part of him. It's, it's not like, like the creator, whatever. He takes material over here and he makes it. We're not saying that, but we are using biblical language that the Son, in some sense, is begotten by the Father. But because they're co-equal and co-eternal, he is eternally begotten. That means he is always being begotten. Don't think of it as a one-time thing in the past. That is limited by the concept of time. That has no meaning to an eternal being. I know it's confusing. Thank goodness it's confusing. In, in one sense. We are talking about God in his nature. We're, we're not talking about something simple. On the other hand, Scripture says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. And so we would say the same thing. In some strange or mysterious sense, the Father is the ground, if you would, of being of the Trinity, from whom the Son is begotten eternally and the Spirit proceeds eternally. Now, when I say that, you might say, well, then the Father is somehow different than the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, not in essence. They are all equally and completely God. But in function, sure. Just like only the Son is the one who gets incarnate, for example. Okay? And then, um, obviously, these three just emphasize are different persons. Yes, Pastor Ken. Yeah, just back to the... Back to the begotten uh, yeah. word, uh, does that also have a sense of uniqueness that, that goes with it? It's monogenes, right, in the Greek. Um, <clears throat> I don't, only begotten son, only unique son, sometimes. Well, yeah, one and only is now how the NIV, it's gotten away from begotten because who uses that kind of language? It's unfortunate, but, you know, I like the King James there, right? <laughs> John 3.16, only begotten son. Um, he certainly is unique. I don't know enough of Greek to know if that Greek word also has embedded in it the idea of uniqueness. Okay, because it could have been used of other things that are begotten. You, you know what I mean? So, but obviously Jesus Christ is unique, and we're going to see that again today when we look at his two natures. Okay, so all of this is to say, guys, it is, it is something, it's a doctrine that has been given a lot of thought for over 2,000 years in Christianity. You and I, thankfully, are raised in churches that assume it and teach it, and we don't have to go through all the difficult thinking again, so to speak, to, you know, to, to come to the conclusions of it. Um, but I would say that when you're dealing with biblical revelation, and that's why I spent a week on what the Bible says about the Son being completely God. And I spent another week on why what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit being a person, right, not a thing, and he is also completely God. We spent two separate weeks on that so that you get the idea, and clearly the Father is God, that we have a tension here. We have three beings who are all referred to as God, and yet we are a monotheistic religion. And somehow we have to balance that. And that makes sense why human analogies tend to all fail in an attempt to explain it, okay? That's all I wanted to say, just dwell on it again briefly, but is there anybody here that wanted to ask a question about the Trinity uh, that maybe you were a bit confused about from last week, yeah? It, um, with a non-believer, in conversations that you have, what, would, what is a simple, quick way to at least get a conversation started? <laughs> 
hi, you're going to hell. No, 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 I, that's, that's horrible. I, I, uh, you said a simple quick. Uh, uh, well, and that's the problem. There is no simple quick, okay? But I would concentrate on Jesus and the fact that he isn't just a man, he's not just a prophet, he's not just a good person, he's not just whatever. He, he is who he claims to be. Before Abraham was, I am. He is who the scriptures claim to be. He's the creator, okay? And that is where I would hammer away because once you realize that Jesus is fully and completely God, then you have to figure out what's going on with the whole nature of God. I would not go to an unbeliever and say, let me explain the Trinity to you. That's, you know, I wouldn't go to an unbeliever and talk about the doctrine of election. There's a lot of things I wouldn't talk about uh, initially that are, are more difficult. But I would hammer away on who Jesus is, for sure. Yeah. All right. So we're looking at impeccability here. I just want to make sure that I didn't have another slide here. Yeah, that's right. All right. Oh, yeah. I wanted to say something, and this is just silly. This is just me thinking. Uh, sometimes um, I come up with these ideas, but it seems to me that the Trinity could possibly, the reality of the Trinity could be embedded in nature, like the three primary colors, for example. It's not two primary colors. It's not 16. It's three. I just find that interesting. Or the fact that atoms, the building blocks of all of life, are made of three things electrons, protons, and neutrons. And now we found that each of those have three subparticles, okay, bosons and all of these sorts of things, okay, muons and whatever. And I just find that fascinating. I'm not making any grand dogmatic statement about it, but I'm just noting that there's a lot of things in nature that are fundamentally uh, given to us in threes. It's just kind of interesting. All right. Yes. No, I don't know. Now, I want to avoid that one, <clears throat> okay, on this. So, um, and I will be counting. What do we got? Maybe 30, 35 people here. Could Jesus sin? We're driving over here, and Rachel says, I think you're asking a trick question. Do you think? It's not a trick question. It is not a trick question. Now, hold on. Before, before I, I don't want any commentary yet, okay? I don't want you spoiling somebody else's thinking about it, okay? So I, I, before you say something, Clem, I just, okay. So, uh, no, no, he had his hand up, but, you know, I want to ask him. But, okay, so I just want right now your vote. That's it. Nothing else. If you're wrong, you're wrong. Okay, if you're right, Hallelujah. <laughs> How many people say, no, Jesus could not have possibly sinned? Now, come on. I got to believe it's the vast majority of people. So that's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Oh, that's a lot of people. I like it. Very good. Wow. How many of you think that Jesus could have sinned? Well, that's quite shocking. Two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven, and I'm in there. Twelve. All right. And uh, were there any I don't knows here? Anybody that didn't vote because you're cheeky? Yeah. Are there 33 people? Bill, did you count? There's 33 people. Is that what you're saying? I thought someone had said that. Oh. No, I said there's more than 30. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> we could spend time and count. So there's no I don't knows? Who's going to admit it now? Because yeah, right. Who's going to admit it now? <laughs> I was going to write up here, I am stupid. No, no, no. No, this, this, this. no, if you don't know, you don't know. It's not an easy question. But I would think if I go to most Christians, the vast majority, this is not a vast majority, but I would have expected the vast majority would say no. And the answer would be simple. Why no, guys? The, he's God. Yeah, because he's God. I mean, give me a break. What a stupid question. Why, why, why would you ask if Jesus could sin? Clem? I, I would ask, can you clarify what you mean by the word could? Mm -hmm. Boy, you guys are tough. <laughs> 
Um, did he, so what I'm saying is, did he have the ability to sin? Yeah, that's it. That's did he? Okay, yeah, right. but then that's then a different that's question. Oh my gosh, really? Wow. I was thinking more just along the lines of God's eternal decree of salvation and plan. I mean, there was no possible way that Christ could have seen, sinned if, if our redemption in the eternal plan of God was that he would have been able to sin. <laughs> but if you want to go for that, was Christ fully human? All right. My first question stinks. Yeah. All right. I am stupid. There you go. Okay. We'll go back again. We'll go back again. Did Jesus have the capability of sinning? If this makes a difference, how many of you would say no? He did not have the capability of sinning. Two, three, four, five, six. Wow. Kathy? Kathy? Seven. Oh, that, that's drastically different. Holy cow. You guys are much smarter than I thought. Uh, all right. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, so those of you who, wait a minute, he did not. Yeah, now I'm confusing myself. So the rest of you say he could have sinned. He had the capability of sinning. Is that correct? Yes. Wow. And that's, uh, well, it's a, at least 20 plus people. What did we have? We have 30 something. All right. We have a lot there. Well, that made a big difference. I don't have to clean up my question there in the future if I have to ask it again. Listen, let's emphasize first, and I've been doing this a couple of different ways. Uh, let's just establish that Jesus was sinless, okay? Just to be clear, okay? And there are going to be biblical reasons for that. And what I mean by that, as you might know, is can I find a Bible, a Bible verse that says Jesus was without sin? Okay, and there you go. Why do you think Jesus couldn't have or didn't sin? Because the Bible tells me he didn't sin. All right, and then I'll look at theological reasons. Why would we theologically conclude that Jesus didn't sin? Okay, you'll see what I mean by that. So first, let's just come here, and I've got five verses, and it's quite something. Peter. John, Paul, and the author of Hebrews all established that Jesus did not sin. So it must be a really important doctrine to them if you get this emphasis here. So here it is, 2 Corinthians, this is Paul, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Hebrews, he's just like us. He sympathizes in our weakness, yet was without sin. Peter as a lamb without blemish and without spot is another way of saying it, but just in case you're unclear, here's another one in the same book. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. And then the last one is John. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. So that's the biblical reasons why we would say Jesus is sinless. Scripture tells us he was sinless. Now I want you to think theologically. Why would we theologically conclude that Jesus was, what, was without sin? Go. One God, three persons. Part of that. Okay, so you would appeal to the fact that he is divine. He's, he's God in his nature and therefore without sin. Okay, fair enough. Katie? He's the Passover lamb, and the Passover lamb had to be spotless. Yeah, there you go, which is, which is this hint here by Peter. So the whole idea of sacrifice, and you go to that whole sacrificial system, and God says that lamb has to be one without defect. It has to be blemish, blemishless and all of that sort of stuff. Good. So you're appealing to the sacrificial system. Excellent. Did I see another hand up here? Nate. Yeah, well, months ago we talked about the fact that God is good and that he is good. He defines what is good. And so he does things only according to his goodness. Good. So you're appealing again, like Amber here, to, to the nature, the, the divine nature of Jesus as being without sin. Good. Anybody else? Yes, the Joyce. The deity dwells in him, Colossians 2.9. Okay, same thing again. You're hammering away on the fact that Jesus is fully God. So we've got that. Yes, ma'am. Um, Nate's mom. And welcome. 
because he was the propitiation or the satisfaction. He could not be the satisfaction for our sin if he sinned himself. He wouldn't satisfy the Father's yeah, now that's really good deep thinking there, all right? You need to come back every week, all right? A uh, uh, pastor's wife, there you go, yeah. But yeah, I want you to think about that. Um, how many sins did it take for Adam and Eve to be kicked out of the Garden of Eden? You know, that's it. And, you know, a minor sin in our book, right? Oh, you ate a forbidden cookie. You know, a piece of fruit, whatever, gee whiz, okay? Uh, but no, active rebellion, disobedience against God and his commands, that's what, you know, is at the heart of all sin. Uh, if all Jesus had done was sin one time, just once, he becomes what? A sinner. And then now how is he going to atone for sinners when he himself is like us? In that sense. So very, very good. So we get to the nature of Jesus. We get to the nature of the sacrificial system. We get to the very nature of salvation. And you used a very nice word there, you know, uh, propitiation, right? That he is taking the wrath of God that is due to us for our sins. He's taking it upon himself as the perfect sacrifice. All of this is to say, good, you're thinking well. You see that there are Biblical verses that say it, but then we want to think theologically as well. Why is it necessary? Why was it like that? All right. So, could, well, I do have written down here, could Jesus have sinned? Now, oh, that's different than capable. I got to change that. All right. Um, I just want you to again come back to the $64,000 question. Back in the day, wasn't it? $64,000? And that is uh, Jesus and his capability or inability. Now, you know that Jesus is fully God. We've already established that. So how on earth would he be capable of sinning? Could we not say, as, as Pastor Jeff said, well, there's an eternal decree by God and this is going to be salvation. And of course, he couldn't violate this whole thing. So we would exclude him even from the capability of it. The problem is the other side of the equation. And that is, Jesus, is he like us or not? And so what I want to do is I want to kind of run through a little bit of the history again as we try to unpack this verse, part of a verse. John 1.14, you know, and the word and... There's the word logos, and I need to point that out because now we have to be really precise in our language here. Just like I said last week, when you're praying, don't say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for dying for my sins. The Father did not die for your sins. The Son died for your sins. I understand we make mistakes, okay? But you need to get your thinking clarified here. So when I'm talking about the eternal Son of God, we're going to talk about the Logos. That's just the Greek word for word. Okay? And when I'm talking about the man who existed and was born of the Virgin Mary 2,000 years ago, I'm talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the man, did not exist 3,000 years ago. The Logos has always existed from eternity. He is the one who created all things, this sort of idea. Are you getting me now? I just want us to be precise here because we're told that this being, spirit being, the Logos, who has existed forever, became flesh. And then, you know, it says, and dwelt, tabernacled among us is literally what it says. He tabernacled with us, that presence of God with us, okay? And this is what we're trying to unpack what does it mean to become flesh? Yeah, so what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the womb of Mary. <clears throat> That's the womb of Mary. <clears throat> Tell your son, try that. Mr. Artist. All right. So <laughs> this is the womb of Mary. And we want to try to figure out 
Here's a little man in there. <laughs> have you ever been, have you ever, sorry, this is a completely ridiculous aside. Have you ever been to Eastern Orthodox churches? They're gorgeous, right? I love Orthodox churches. If you're ever around a big Orthodox church and you can go in and check it out, do so. They're just gorgeous. I love them. Iconography all over the place. Paintings, you know, beautiful stuff. A, a dome at the top with a blue sky and angels painted and all of that. It's just gorgeous, okay? Um, and in Orthodox churches, the Mother Mary is never portrayed alone. In Catholicism, she's always or often, most times, portrayed alone. Not with Orthodoxy. She's always with the baby, Jesus. But the baby is actually just an adult shrunk down <laughs> and then put in her arm or whatever. It's never a baby baby. It's like an adult Jesus shrunk down and then there you go. There's a little mini Jesus there. I, I find that really funny, but all right. Uh, uh, no, I don't think he has a beard. Oh, well, you know what? I got to think about that. That's a really... <laughs> There's a ton of iconography that's just like that. It's... Okay. Uh, so they basically take the adult Jesus and they miniaturize him, you know, but okay. <laughs> yeah, does he have a beard? I gotta... <laughs> he must. He must in some of those. Okay. <laughs> what we want to know is, in Mary, now remember, she did not have sexual relations with a man, okay? We just, you know, throw that in there. She's a legitimate biological virgin, okay? Yes. Nevertheless, there's a person in her womb, okay? Did the Logos come here and fill the flesh. So in her womb is human flesh, and then the Logos comes and fills that flesh as if it is the soul. Okay? It's a possibility. Or do we have... You know, all Siamese twins, kind of, you know, they're attached, okay, but in essence... The Logos attaches himself to a fully human person. This person here is not fully human. This is a human shell with the Logos filling it. This is a fully human person with a human soul, and the Logos attaches, and now you have two together, okay? That's, that is, now I, I know this is weird, but this is the debate that, you know, that the early church deals with for centuries. I'm not talking a weekend seminar workshop, okay? I'm talking about centuries, all right? Uh, your gut feeling, which one of those is right? Neither? Really? Boy, you guys are really difficult this morning. <laughs> Taught us not to like analogies? What was that, Biz? Yeah, I was going to say, analogies always fall yeah. short. Oh, it's not an analogy. That's an actual thing happening. It's not an analogy. Victor, we can smell a trap. Oh, you guys, are, you guys are really, you guys really stink. All right, listen. You are correct. They are both wrong. And there are two schools of thought in early church history, one that's centered in Antioch and the other in Alexandria. Remember, Antioch is the place where followers of Jesus were first called Christians. It's the home base of Paul and his missionary journeys and all of that. It becomes one of the key centers of early church history, early Christianity, Antioch, just north of Israel, you know, okay? And then Alexandria, the city in North Egypt, northern Egypt, founded there well, named after Alexandria, uh, Al uh, Alexander the Great. And these two become really important centers of early Christianity, and they're debating. And one takes one view, and one takes the other, and they keep going back and forth, back and forth for centuries. And so we're going to walk through these really quickly, but this is going to help you. So, Katie, here comes the heresies you were looking for today. <laughs> what I first want you to note, though, is the years. These are the places, these are the cities where ecumenical councils were held. This is the first ecumenical council. Ecumenical is just a fancy word for worldwide. So if we had a council in North Aurora, 
to determine something about what our church is going to do, we would say, great. It only has authority for North Aurora and nowhere else. An ecumenical council is a council where people come from all different parts of the world who are Christians to represent the church to hammer out doctrine. And when they determine an ecumenical conclusion, that is a conclusion that is meant to be held by all the churches equally. If you separate from that ecumenical council, you become what, Katie? A heretic. All right, very good. So, look at the years. <laughs> this is already 300 years after Jesus. That's just shocking. These are the first four ecumenical councils. I just want you to understand that Protestantism, Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy all agree with these four councils. Okay? Typically, cults are going to say, nah, we don't like this for this reason, that reason, whatever, okay? But this is kind of foundational Christian thinking that we believe is being, you know, ultimately as we're wrestling with God's self-revelation in Scripture. But this is three centuries after Jesus. Now, a guy comes on the scene. You saw him last week, Arius. And Arius <clears throat> was this guy. He was the one who said, all right, we have to maintain that there's only one God. And if we make the Logos God, there's no way we can get around the fact that we have more than one God. So the Father alone is God. He makes the Logos. It's his first grand creation. And then the Logos makes everything else. And the Holy Spirit's over here. You got to keep in mind the spirit is kind of like an energy or force. This is, this is modern day Jehovah's Witness kind of stuff here, okay? Ultimately, they are modern day Arians. And so Arius is the guy who <clears throat> is going to be the first that's tackled here. A really key early church father, his name is Athanasius. You may remember that I have a son named Calvin, whose middle name is Athanasius. Thank you, honey. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what a great name. Don't, don't give me that look, Biz. That is a great name. Calvin Athanasius. Oh, wow. Oh, it's just such a great name. <laughs> All right. <laughs> For a while, I said, you know, you should go by C. Athanasius Cooligan. Yeah. Uh, you know, okay. He says, no, uh-uh. All right, anyway, he couldn't even spell his middle name for I don't know how many years. I think just last year he started spelling it right. <laughs> He's getting married in June, by the way. So. Uh, Arius. We, we, Arius is going to be condemned. And Athanasius is going to be the key church father there at this council. And by the way, all four of these cities are in modern-day Turkey. Okay, so if you're looking at a map of the Roman Empire, why is, why is everything happening there? Because it's in the middle. It's right in the middle. Modern day uh, Istanbul is Constantinople. It's just right there. Okay, all right. And he's basically going to say, Jesus is not fully God. We, we, we can't say that because we can't maintain one God. And Athanasius is going to have a lot of arguments. Ultimately, I just want you to remember this one quote. If Jesus is not fully God, then you do not have God as your Savior. Okay? All right? If he's just an angel, even if he's the, mark, my, uh, the archangel Michael, well, then your Savior is an angel, is not God. In order for him to truly save, he must be fully God. Now, there's a lot to unpack there. If we had time, we could, but we're talking about why the incarnation is so important. Why is it that God must become a human being in order to save us from our condition? And that is where guys like Athanasius are going to say, because the human, fallen human nature, well, human nature, not fallen, human nature has to be in some way coupled with divine nature in order to eat of immortality. I know that sounds weird for Protestants, but for now, we'll just leave it at that, okay? So, 
from Nicaea comes the conclusion that Jesus must be fully God. All right, and that's simple in one sense. We've already proven it biblically. Now the question is, all right, so we know there's that man Jesus. How, how is he fully God? And I've said this before in the past. Um, before in the past, it's needlessly redundant. Um, yeah. Your problem and my problem typically is with the man on the street and we're sharing the gospel to somehow prove that Jesus is God. That's just kind of a ridiculous sort of thought. In the early church, the exact problem was the problem. We all knew that Jesus was, you know, unique, completely different than anybody else. Maybe he wasn't human. And you had something called docetism, very early heresy in the church that he just appeared to take on flesh. I've said it before, if you went to pinch Jesus, what would happen? There'd be nothing to pinch, okay? Because he doesn't have real flesh. And out of this came Gnosticism, full-blown Gnosticism, which we've talked about before, okay? That's the problem in the early church is the questioning of the real humanity of Jesus, not the real deity. Gnosticism, you're going to have church fathers that all the way into the 500s are writing against Gnosticism. That's how persistent that problem was in the early church. And you have letters in the New Testament that are, you know, talking to that issue. Um, those, here's the spirit of the Antichrist, those who say that Jesus did not come in the flesh. Okay, that sort of thing. That's 1 John. Yes, Cynthia. Just to be clear, did Arius ultimately still believe that Jesus was our Savior, just that he was yep. God? Yes, and if you went... The, the, the issue is this, and I want to be fair, all right? If I go to a Jehovah's Witness today, they'll say that Jesus is Lord. They'll say that uh, he's Savior, because those are the words that are used to describe him. But he's just the Archangel Michael who became a man. He's not Jehovah. He's not God. Now, my issue then, Cynthia, is, well, now, if you are undermining the whole person of Jesus, are you not undermining his work? And I would say emphatically, yes. And this is why the incarnation is important theologically for us, is to understand that Jesus must be completely God in order for him to actually completely save. Okay? Now, what I want to be fair uh, is these guys are dealing with concepts that are difficult, and they're wrestling with them. And we call them, I say condemned, but we call them heretics. Once the vote came... Once the time came and the explanations were given for why you, Arius, are wrong, if you persist in that error, then you're being stubborn and you probably are lost. I'm not the one to make any final decision, but you know the word heretic is used by the church to mean you're shut out from the church, you're shut out from salvation. Okay? And some of these, you know, they're difficult, no doubt. If afterwards Arius said, Oh, I see my, you know, the error of my ways. Okay, but he did not. And it's the same with Jehovah's Witnesses, I think, today. My grandmother was a Jehovah's Witness. Um, I believe she was completely deceived by what they were saying. But having then explained to her why it was wrong that she would persist in it, I have no hope for her soul. Zero. Okay? Unfortunately. Currently. She's dead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if you want to pray for her, then no, please do so. No. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. She, she, did, she did die. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do the Jehovah's Jody. Witnesses do with the book of Hebrews where it talks about... Throw it out. No, no, no. Uh, it talks about what? Jesus superior to the angels. Yeah. So, you know, up until 1950, the Jehovah's Witnesses used the King James Version. And there in Hebrews 1, 6, the, the God commands the angels to worship the Son. And you can't get around that. Okay? But they did. They came up with their own New World Translation. They changed the verse. And now the word to worship means to give obeisance to. That means to obey the Son. So now it just is watered down to God is commanding the angels to obey the Son. And well, okay, fine. 
but that's not what it says. And that's the way they deceive. They deceive in 150 different ways. I have nothing but contempt for those guys, unfortunately. But yeah, all right, we're gonna move on. Apollinarius comes along and he says, okay, I got a solution. Here's the solution. Jesus is like a Coke bottle. So whenever you think of Apollinarius, think Coke bottle. And the Coke bottle, yeah, he was a man ahead of his time. And the Coke bottle is coming down, you know, it's been made, whatever, and it's coming down the conveyor belt, and then the little thing comes, the little, you know, nozzle comes down, and psh, and it fills it up with Coca-Cola, okay? And that's the Logos. Psh, filled up. By the way, this is Lori's love, love language. Oh. Oh, really? All right. <laughs> this is an analogy, and it's a perfect analogy. Because I'm not trying to describe an indescribable God, right? I'm trying to describe a heresy of a guy with that name. <laughs> All right. This is a perfect analogy. All right. So that's it. Now come from uh, this time, we got these guys called Cappadocian Fathers. These are three theologians, three churchmen, Cappadocia is in the middle of Turkey, modern day Turkey, and they come from there, and here's another famous quote. They say, basically, this can't be right, because if Jesus is not fully human, then he doesn't save humans fully. And here's the quote, that which is not assumed is not healed, okay? That which is not taken up by Jesus, who is God himself, is not then healed by Jesus. So Jesus just takes on flesh, that means the human soul still has a problem. Your human soul still has a problem. My human soul still has a problem, okay? So Apollinarius, you cannot be right. And Constantinople concluded that Jesus must be fully God. You mean okay. man? Uh, man, thank you. So he, first one, fully God, fully man. And so now we're getting there. We're getting there, but there's still debates. And by the way, these four don't end the debates. There's going to be two other councils that are come as late as 680 asking whether or not Jesus had one or two wills. They just never got enough of this. Okay? But here we are. So now we're trying to figure out, maybe it's this one then. I see, Nestorius says, this is how it's going to work. Jesus is indeed fully man. And the Logos comes into the womb of Mary there, so to speak, and also attaches himself. So I want you to do a little exercise for me. Put your hands together. Here we go. There we are. And so now, this is Jesus and this is the human Jesus, and this is divine Jesus, okay? And here we go. All right. So, Jesus is hungry and tired and needs to sleep. Which Jesus is that? That's the human Jesus, right? Okay. Jesus calms the storm. Which is that? That's the divine Jesus, you see? There are two, he's almost schizophrenic, okay? There are two people sewn together, all right, so let me ask you this, because I've heard this, I have heard this by a lot of Christians. When Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the human part of Jesus speaking. I've heard this from the pulpit. I'm not saying living hope. Yeah, I have. Several times. I'm just joking. Okay. But yeah, um, I've heard a lot of Christians say that. That's the human Jesus speaking. That's a big problem. Because now my issue is, well, how do I determine when it's just the human Jesus speaking and when it's the divine Jesus speaking in the scriptures, okay? Which one is it? Which one am I going to believe? Are you following me on that? Okay. And so what the church is going to say, and this is just an incredible conclusion, these two here, I think, that they're going to say, Nestorius, you're not right. We cannot have two Jesuses, one human, one divine. I'll give you, have any of you ever heard the pastor, motivational speaker, Miles Monroe? You have heard Miles Monroe, okay. 
Uh, Miles Monroe is, uh, he was really, so he's a Jamaican, I think, well, he's a, a Caribbean guy. I can't remember which island. Um, real popular in Africa. Oh, my goodness, people love Miles Monroe. Uh, incredible motivational speaker. If you want to be motivated, go listen to Miles Monroe, okay? You want good Christology? Maybe not so much. And Miles Monroe famously said, at the cross, Christ said to Jesus, I'll see you in three days. Okay? Because he makes this separation between the two persons. All right? Miles Monroe doesn't understand church history very well there, okay, on that. This is the difficulty, and, and it can be very misleading here. You can't treat Jesus as if he's two persons, this schizophrenic kind of personality, all right? And ultimately, we need to know that when Jesus speaks, it is God speaking to us 100% of the time. Now you might say, yeah, but Victor, God doesn't get hungry. No, but Jesus did. I mean, did Jesus die? Well, don't tell me he couldn't have died because God can't die. Jesus, the God-man, died. Literally died. Okay? You have to treat him as one person. They conclude this at Ephesus. And then the problem comes with this guy Eutychus. And he says, well, gee whiz, if he is God, and here's the thing, and we're finally getting to the impeccability of Jesus. And that is that most people will say Jesus could not have sinned. Why? Because he's God. And Eutychus said, well, if, all right, one person, but what do we do with the two natures here? He's fully God, he's fully man. Well, I know, and... It makes sense, logically. The divine nature swallows up the human nature. It just dominates it completely. The fact is, I have never, as far as I, I, I don't think there is anybody, but I've never read anybody in early church history who believed that Jesus was completely God and completely man and said that the God nature was swallowed up by the human nature. It, I, I've never seen that. But it makes sense that we would say the eternal, omnipotent, divine nature somehow dominates the weaker human nature. And he likened it to a drop of vinegar in the ocean. You go to the ocean and you drop a drop of vinegar in it, and what happens to that vinegar? Well, go, good luck trying to find it now. It's gone. Okay? It has become dominated by the divine nature. And this, to me, is just an amazing conclusion. Because for me, logically, if you have one person, you really should have one predominant nature. And if you have two persons, then you should have two natures. And the fact that they mix them up, one person and two natures, is really quite uh, a conclusion that I think um, only comes supernaturally in some sense. And that is to say that, Eutychus, you're wrong. He has to be fully God and fully human. And what you're basically saying is his humanity is nothing. It's completely thrown away. And we can't have that either. Out of Chalcedon comes the Chalcedonian Creed. So you know the Apostles' Creed. We've looked at the Nicene Creed a couple weeks ago. Here's the Chalcedon part of the Chalcedonian Creed. There's a lot of other things they say at Chalcedon, but here it is on this. Following, therefore, the Holy Fathers, we confess one and the same, our Lord Jesus Christ, and we all teach harmoniously that he is the same perfect in Godhead, the same perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, the same of a reasonable soul and body. They just mean there that all of him, okay, this is true of all of him, not just parts. Homoousios is just a Greek word that means of the same substance. That's all it means, okay? Homoousios with the Father in Godhead, and the same, homoousios with us in manhood. It means that as much as the Father is God, Jesus is God. As much as I am a human being, Jesus is a human being. Like us in all things except sin. That is the point, right? Hebrews says that. He's made like the children. He's made like us in all ways except sin. And we've already established that biblically. Begotten before ages of the Father and Godhead. 
The same in the last days for us and for our salvation, born of the Mary, the Virgin, Theotokos, we're not going to worry about that now, in manhood, one and the same, Christ, Son, Lord, unique. Here are the words, beautiful words, acknowledged in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation, the difference of the natures being by no means taken away because of the union. We call this the hypostatic union, if you want some theology here. But rather the distinctive character of each nature being preserved and each combining into one person. And it continues. So if I ask you the question, could Jesus have sinned? And you say no and you appeal to his divinity, you are making the mistake of Eutychus, and you are denying what the church has declared as accepted doctrine in the church. Okay, Now, you're an eight-year-old Christian. You don't understand this sort of stuff. Okay, We understand that a six-year-old can be genuinely saved. You don't have to have all of the theology all perfectly right and all of that. I would just simply say, though, that as you grow in knowledge, which is what Scripture says, right? You need to grow in knowledge. Don't say, oh, this theology, I don't want any more to do with it. That's for the pastors over there. It's got nothing to do with me. I just love Jesus. Isn't that good enough? Yeah, yes and no. You need to be growing in your faith, in your knowledge. And upon understanding, or at least being shown this, do you have questions? Sure, of course. But at some point, you need to say, yeah, I do understand why that's right. Let me just say this. Jesus is portrayed in the book of Hebrews as an example to me of someone who was tempted yet did not sin. And if you tell me, well, he couldn't have sinned because he was God after all, well, then I get zero comfort from that because I don't have a divine nature overriding my human nature every time I want to do something stupid. I just don't. So what is the comfort here? And I find it most amazing. The comfort is Jesus as fully human, right? Think Adam before Adam fell into sin. That's what Jesus is, and that's what Scripture calls him, the last Adam, okay, or the second Adam. That Jesus, every time he was tempted, every single time, said no. Why? Not because he was God, but because he exercised his freedom of will to say no. The thing that Adam failed to do in the garden. Adam surrounded by a million fruit-bearing trees, and he could eat from any of them without inhibition and completely for his pleasure and said, oh, but what about that one over there that God said don't eat from? And there he goes, he and his wife, and they both eat. And there's Jesus after 40 days being tempted by the devil in the wilderness with no food around at all, is tempted. Why don't you turn that stone over there into some bread and fill, fill your stomach? I mean, I know you're hungry. Resists. And that's what he does. Most incredibly, if you say Jesus could not have sinned because of his divine nature, you actually deny his freedom of will. <laughs> okay? Which is quite incredible if you're an Arminian. All right? I'm just saying, you need to make sure your categories are all kind of balanced properly. That's all. So, all right. Eutychus says, Jesus' human nature is completely swallowed up by his divine, and this is wrong. Jesus has two natures. They're, they're right here. Acknowledged in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. Let me ask you, who walked on the water? Well, yes. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't just his divine nature and what? He left his human nature over there on the side while he walked over the water and came back? No, the God-man did. And that's what we have to talk about. Who died on the cross? The God-man died on the cross. He did die on the cross. Okay? And to, to, to make this bifurcation, this separation between the two, is going to lead you into difficulty and into trouble and ultimately confusion.
All right, questions or comments about this? This is the incarnation. I mean, I still want to answer, so what? Why, why does this matter? But yeah, Clem. One thing I've heard, I've heard talking with uh, non-Christian circles is like, well, you know, but since Jesus didn't sin, we can't really understand us as humans. And the, the analogy that I heard was like, well, the only person who holds a world record for it, you know, 1,200 pound squat is the one who actually did it. Everybody else who tried and failed doesn't really know how heavy 12, uh, 1,200 pounds is. Mm. So because he didn't sin, he's the only one who understands what it is to fully resist sin to the nth degree. Hmm. Because everyone else has failed. All of us have failed. So I, I, found, I found that to be helpful. I think that's very helpful. Very helpful. Thank you, Clem. Uh, and, and the fact is, we don't understand what it means to hold out and resist forever. You know what I mean? For your whole life. Yeah. Jesus, again, is sinless. Could he have sinned is one of those, we call him a counterfactual. I, I had um, uh, James, the police officer, his wife, um, Adriana. Adriana, yes, brought again her, their daughter who had another question for me. Uh, if Adam had not eaten the fruit would we still be living in the Garden of Eden? Okay. And I told her, that's a counterfactual, which she understood completely. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. No, but seriously. Uh, we like asking these questions that did not, in fact, ever happen. So in one sense, to ask the question, could Jesus have sinned or was he capable of sinning, is a, a, a nowhere question because, in fact, he did not sin. So why would we even ask it? But it's a real helpful one as we're trying to wrestle with how he could be both God and human at the same time. Okay? So there's where we are with it. All right. Ken, what you were going to say. You had your hand up, I thought. I just, uh, in terms of the impeccability, I, I know that I <coughs> an article about external temptation of Christ versus internal temptation okay. of Christ. Internally, no, he's not tempted because he's He's God. He's, he's never going to say yes to, to, to sin. But temptations come. They came from they came from when he was in the world. Anyways, do you think that's a helpful category at all? That the theologian, the guy writing this article, would say there's for him. You know, for was us, it Piper? Was it Piper? Then no, I don't like it at all. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. No, it I, it, it Piper's was, great. That's why I don't like him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. Listen. Um, Ken, even as you're saying it, I get uncomfortable there because it sounds like the same problem, and that is it's an appeal to his divinity, therefore he couldn't have sinned. And all I would say is for him to be fully human like I am fully human, he must have the capability of sinning. He must, or he's not fully human. Now, you start to make the distinction between external and internal and all of that. I must admit that confuses me a bit. All I know is that man, Jesus, was tempted and he had the ability to fall just as Adam did and he chose not to. And I'm going to leave it at that. I'm, I'm going to leave it with, if you want a certain ambiguity, that's all right. But I, I, I've got, I'd have to think a little more about it, but it makes me slightly uncomfortable. Yeah, I would think a lot. I mean, I'm Go thinking ahead. just the illustration you gave about turning the bread, the rocks into bread. I mean, being hungry mm. is just a natural thing that comes internally when you haven't yeah. eaten. And it was a source of temptation. So I don't know what the internalness is. No, that's really means, good. That's very I mean, good. Point. Us and men yeah, were, would say that if, if, he got if, hungry. Yes. But there's no way that that he was going to succumb to that temptation internally, even though it was coming at him externally. Internally, he was never going to say yeah. yes to that temptation. Well, okay, and then I, yeah. all I will do is I'll get back to he didn't. Yeah. So we'll we'll just you know be happy with the fact that he didn't, and now we are dealing with a question that we don't need to answer because it never in fact happened. But yeah, I I, I get it, Ken. Uh, it's it's a tough one, and that's. Uh, listen, uh, you know, not to minimize that, Ken, uh, these guys were debating these things for centuries, and here we are in five minutes trying to, oh, yeah, oh, <laughs> okay, yes, Amber. Um, are you going to finish the womb thing? Can it just be part of Mary, part of God? 
came together? Or what's going to happen here? You You're asking for an analogy? <laughs> no. You're not getting no, it. <laughs> this beautiful womb here. Um, <laughs> Mary gave birth to a man, Jesus Christ, right? Fully human like any other man that had come before. Now, you might say, but there was no sperm present. Well, God, obviously, who is the maker of all life, made a man. And the conception is miraculously done by the Holy Spirit. Follow me on that. Why is that necessary? Why couldn't it not have just been a man and then God did his adoptionism thing? Which, you remember adoptionism last week? Why couldn't it have just been a normal birth? Joseph and Mary do what they do, and Jesus is born. Yes, sir. Because that would have been a sin, right? Okay, born a sin type of thing. Okay, okay. So the, the, the act would not have been sin. But um, clarify for that with me. What, what do you mean? Jesus would be born what? With sin? Is that sin because they had sex, right? Because it's Mary's flesh. Because it's Well, it is Mary's. Uh, it is Mary, right? <laughs> okay. So this because is why Mary the Catholic needed... Church cleans up Mary, right? Uh, they do clean up Mary. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Uh, oh, listen, just hold on. Before we start running around here. So um, just to say that sex between a husband and a wife is not sinful. OK, so the act itself, I just want to make clear if that's what you were saying, is not an, a sinful act. But the production of that human then comes from the line of Adam all the way down and is indeed inheriting a sin nature, not just a human nature. So here's the kicker. How do you protect Jesus from inheriting a sin nature? You don't put a man in the equation. Do I get an amen from the women yeah. in the room? <laughs> Woo! Amen. All right. There, I'll pull a little Miles Monroe there. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> amen. Okay. Yeah. Listen. Who ate the fruit first? She did. Eve did. Who do we say is responsible? You know, those women that say, I don't like the whole head of the household stuff and male headship and all that. Gee whiz, you want to be the one then responsible for it. By all means, take it. Thank you. Yeah, okay. You inherit the sin, not of Eve, but of Adam. It seems to me, in some material sense then, that sin is inherited. It's passed down through the men. I guess. This is odd, right? A virgin birth. But Amber, uh, Mary gives birth to a fully human being, Jesus, who is nevertheless also fully God. And that's all I can say. All right? There's no sperm involved in the sense that Joseph donated it. But God still makes a human being in this womb. Did he then take an egg from Mary and, you know, fertilize it? You know, how, you know, now I'm getting into needless, ridiculous speculation, okay? All I know is Jesus Christ, fully human being and always human except born with inherited sin, is born from that womb. Is not then coupled with a separate person that we call the Logos, not replacing the human soul with the divine soul. And see, we're back to the same thing again, just like with the Trinity. We can exclude all the knots. It's not this, it's not that, it's not the other thing. And now we're left with ultimately something that is a bit of a mystery. And we just have to settle with that. Now here's the thing, and this is where we're going to conclude. The incarnation is really vital to our faith. Without it, you have nothing. You really do. You have nothing. Islam doesn't have the incarnation, so what do they have? A list of do's and don'ts. Here's the five pillars of Islam. You do these things and you're saved, okay? And so forth and so uh, Judaism doesn't have the incarnation, so what do you have? You have the Ten Commandments. You have the law. You have another list of do's and don'ts. That's what it is, and it always comes down to that. The incarnation secures our salvation. God becomes genuinely a human being. Now, go to the first century. That's an abomination in the thinking of the Jews in the first century. That God would take on flesh? Are you nuts? I can't even make a graven image to represent him, let alone that he takes on flesh. But to the Greeks, it was equally nonsense. What did they believe? Flesh is evil. 
The spirit is the good. You won't have a spirit taking on legitimate flesh, and that's why you get Gnosticism and all those things that came out of that. You and I have ceased to be stunned by the incarnation. We have, unfortunately. Uh, okay, we've had a healthy dose of good theology, but we have ceased to be stunned by it. Let me just say this, and then Mel, I'll come to you. That by being fully human, Jesus is able to present, if you would, payment fully from the human side to God and satisfy what we were owed or what we were owing to God. And by being fully God, he is able to absorb, if you would, the eternal wrath of the Father. Okay, all of this is to say that he becomes the perfect mediator. He's perfectly God. He's perfectly human. He perfectly represents both parties who are currently at enmity with each other because of sin. He comes and he takes on the form of sin, right? The form of a man. He, he obeys the law completely and fully satisfies the righteous requirements of God as only God could do in the form, though, of a human, right? So on our behalf, he does it for us. He perfectly represents us in a way that Adam failed to do. And this is what the incarnation is all about. When, Jesus, when, when, Paul, ah, when Peter says that you partake of the divine nature, in some way in the incarnation, humanity and divinity come together and humanity partakes of the divine. No. No. I have an example or an analogy oh. in our, of the incarnation. On my property, I had a field, and I planted the bush, and I put chips and stuff around it for a couple of years, and then one day I'm out there and I'm digging through it to clean it out, and lo and behold, there is a silver salamander. So I take it and put it back into the pond area, and when I was subbing at the high school, I looked up, you know, to find out what this creature was. The silver salamander is an endangered species in Illinois. This thing appeared out of nowhere. It was just a field. I pl planted a bush and I, you know, chipped it up, uh, feed it. The environment was such that that salamander appeared. Now... <laughs> Did a mom and daddy salamander lay an egg in there? Where did that salamander come from? It was created in real time, I believe. It was some kind of incarnation. <laughs> that really <laughs> happened. You're going to spring this one on me <laughs> with no time left, Mel? Okay, we're so, it's very we're done. <laughs> that creature was created in real time. I Sounds like a Marvel character, the silver salamander. <laughs> but God put it together because the environment was such. Just like if we had all the forestry, I believe the dinosaurs would be back because of the environment. He has more stories, by the way. <laughs> yeah, listen, I, uh, it's an analogy. <laughs> Where did you go with those? <laughs> yeah, it happened. And, and I personally, I would say in that situation, Mel, there's some logical scientific reason for how, uh, how it happened. But all right, we're going to have to end there. We're out of time. Uh, next week, we are going to look at the rest of the life of Jesus. But we're going to concentrate. We only got two lessons left. We're going to concentrate on the atonement and, and what happens in, in the atonement. Why does this man who died 2,000 years ago somehow, how is that related to my sins and all of that? And I'm not complete on my lesson by any means. I haven't even started it um, to know what else we're going to do. But we're going to be done Christology next week. And then we got one other lesson on pneumatology, doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And then we're done. Uh, and we come back in June. And we're going to look at hermeneutics, that is, how to understand the Bible. And then we'll get to theology again in the fall. Yes, please, Ken. Thank you. Father, heaven, thank you for uh, this opportunity to come together and to continue to grow in our knowledge of, uh, of you and your Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, that we 
Um, confess, Father, that uh, oftentimes we're not as stunned as we should be by uh, theology. So help us to uh, see the, the wonder and the beauty of it and the power of it. Uh, help us to be uh, stunned each time we come across these truths. Thank you for Victor's time that he puts in to this each week to teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you. Have a good worship service.